I do believe in free will until a certain extent. Um, but then it's a really hard thing to define, uh, depending on where you are. It's war, there is, you know, those type of thing. And I only thought, you know, those things exist because you have the ability to choose it. It's a bit scary to think that everything has been predetermined, because then if you think about it, why are you even caring about things? I don't know. I think, I think we do have free will to some extent. A lot of people would argue we don't. I'd like to think so, but um, yeah, I'll go with yes. It's, it's, it's nicer to go with yes. I like to think we're alive for some reason, even if it's just for learning from our mistakes. To an extent, I would say that you have free will to do what you, what you would like, but it's always going to bring a consequence. So you, you can't, um, you don't have free will where you could, you know, go and just do whatever you want without any, any consequence. I feel like, I don't know, let's start with the genes we get. We get a set of like skills or stuff like that within them, the looks, and they kind of determine what your life's going to be. It's difficult to say, to be honest, people are, individuals and the brain, how everything works, is very, very difficult. It's, it's very complex. In a certain way, I think our free will like, is, is like, it's, it's restricted by laws, but we have it. So that's a interesting one. I think we have, Christopher Hitchens put it great way, I think we have free will because we have no other choice. Uh, I would have said yes. Um, but there's a lot of psychological and neurological research now indicating that what we think is free will was actually something that we decided before we realised we were going to do it. Free will? I, 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 I think some, to some degree we do, um, to some degree we don't. These questions are really hard. <laughs> Let me introduce our next speaker, Sharon Dirux. Sharon is a senior tutor at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. Now, originally from a scientific background, she actually has a PhD in brain imaging from the University of Cambridge and has held research positions in both the UK and USA. Sharon speaks and lectures in the UK, Europe and North America on science, theology, the mind and the soul and the problem of evil. Recently, she spoke at the Veritas Forum at the University of Oxford. Now, Sharon's appeared on several BBC programmes, including Radio 2, Good Morning Sunday, Radio 4's Beyond Belief, and she's also the author of an award-winning book on suffering, and it's titled Why? Looking at God, Evil, and Personal Suffering. I've had Sharon on my show a few times and on that specific issue, and, uh, and it's a really great book. I do recommend it. In fact, her latest book, though, deals with the issue she's going to be addressing tonight. It's called Am I Just My Brain? And it examines questions of human identity from the perspectives of neuroscience, philosophy, and theology. Good evening, thank you for being here. I would love to start by um, telling you a story from um, my childhood. Uh, an early childhood memory that I have is of sitting by a window uh, on a rainy day, uh, watching the drops splash against the pane. I'm not really sure how old I was. I must have been around nine or 10. But like all normal children, I spent most of my life racing around, probably on roller skates or playing some sort of ball game. But at this particular moment, I was still, and my mind had time to drift. And I remember a series of questions popping into my head. Why can I think? Why do I exist? Why am I a living, breathing, conscious person who experiences life? Now, I don't really remember where those questions came from. I was raised in a very loving home, but not in a particular religious tradition. And yet the questions were just there, unprompted. 
Now, I know I'm not the first to have this kind of moment. When any of us sit still for long enough, all kinds of things bubble to the surface of our consciousness. Conscious awareness seems to be central to what it means to be a living, breathing human being. Perhaps the philosopher Descartes was right in saying that the thing that we know with most certainty is that we are conscious. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. We each have a first-person experience on the world. And as Thomas Nagel put it in 1974, there is something that it is like to be you. But what exactly are you? What exactly am I? What are human beings? Well, this is a question that has occupied people for centuries at every stage of human history. Are we advanced primates? Are we machines? Do we have a soul? Are we just physical beings? Or is there more to us than that? The question, what is a human being, asks a question of identity. Now, many answers are offered today on the question of identity. The fashion and cosmetics industry would say, you are your body. The financial world might say, you are your income. The political world might say, you are your influence. And the academy might say, you are what you publish and what you write. Well, neuroscientists have recently weighed in on this question surrounding identity, and they say your brain defines you. This you that you are certain exists is brain activity. Consciousness is brain activity. You are your brain. The choices that you make for good or ill, the personality that you have, the behaviors that you exhibit, even whether or not you hold religious beliefs are all dictated by the activity in your brain. Now, I don't need to convince an audience such as this how incredible the human brain is. The human brain is more developed in humans than in any other creature. It contains more cells than there are stars in the sky, somewhere between 80 and 100 billion. And every neuron at any one time is sending thousands of impulses to its neighbors at speeds of over 250 miles per hour. I have studied the human brain at close quarters. I will never forget the day when I saw a brain removed from a body. A number of us were there to study the anatomy of the brain, and the first stage was to watch its removal from the body. This was a deeply sobering and reverent experience commanding utmost respect for the woman who had given her body so that others could learn. But does it follow that everything that it means to be a conscious human being can be explained in terms of brain chemistry and electrical activity? After all, some brilliant scientists believe this. We've already heard about the scientific work of Francis Crick, who co-discovered DNA and won the joint Nobel Prize in 1962. And yet he said this in his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, a couple of decades later. He said, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. And this hypothesis is so alien to the ideas of most people alive today that it can truly be called astonishing. 
Well, 50 years later, this hypothesis is far from alien. People on the streets of Coventry are espousing it. Some no longer consider it a hypothesis. It is seen by some as scientific fact. Well, you might be wondering, so what? What does it matter what you believe about what sits between your ears? Well, if we are simply our brains, the implications are notable. As we've already seen in the video played at the start of this talk, there are significant implications for free will. If we are just our brains, then are we really free and able to make meaningful decisions, or do we just do what our brains tell us? Secondly, there are ethical implications. What is the value of a human life? Is personhood dependent on having a fully functioning brain? And if so, what value do we assign to those whose brains are not fully developed, such as the unborn or premature babies or those with brain damage or those with degenerative diseases such as dementia and Alzheimer's. And thirdly, there are implications for artificial intelligence. If human consciousness can be entirely explained in terms of brain activity, then what are the implications for AI? Will there one day be conscious androids walking the streets? But this is all to say that the beliefs that we hold on this subject are not just for the neuroscientist and philosopher. They are not niche. They are mainstream, and they have far-reaching implications. Now, AI is improving speed, and accuracy in all kinds of areas of life. But processing ability and conscious awareness are not the same thing. Just because an algorithm appears to be conscious does not necessarily mean that they are conscious. We only need to try and have an in-depth conversation with Siri, Google, or Alexa to highlight this. My children recently struck up a conversation with Siri, which went like this. Siri, how are you? I'm fine, thanks for asking. Siri, who made you? I, Siri, was designed by Apple in California. Siri, are you a person? Sorry, Sharon, I've been advised not to discuss my existential status. <laughs> Siri, why are we here? I don't know, maybe the Genius Bar folks can answer that. Siri, why do we exist? To have conversations like these. Siri, why do you exist? I process, therefore I am. Just because an algorithm appears to be conscious does not necessarily mean that it is conscious. Humans have an inner world, a conscious mind that needs some explaining. And actually, there are really two different things at play in this whole conversation. There is the brain, with all of its cells and neurons and electrical activity and synapses and chemicals. And then there is the mind with all of its thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories and decisions. And in this talk, mind and consciousness can be thought of as overlapping. Consciousness is part of the mind. The mind is the bearer of consciousness. And so another key question we need to be asking is, what is the relationship between the mind and the brain? Well, this is the million dollar question that lies at the heart of this whole conversation. This is the question that has been debated for centuries. It is known as the mind-brain problem. 
How do you get from brain cells to thoughts? How do you get from electrical activity to that conversation was really difficult today? How do you get from brain chemistry to what it is like to be you? And the perspective driving some of this discussion is that mind and brain are essentially the same thing. People that say you are your brain, they're saying mental processes are brain processes. Conscious states are brain states. And that's really a bit like saying there isn't really anything that it is like to be you. There's only brain activity. But surely this is an absurd way of thinking about human beings that falls short if we ask three really helpful questions of this view. Is it coherent? Can it be lived? And does it have explanatory power? Firstly, is it coherent? Does you are your brain make sense according to its own frames of reference? It does not. You see, the very view that you are your brain cannot even be expressed without presupposing consciousness. It's a bit like saying my first-person perspective on the world is that there is no first-person perspective. You see, to deny consciousness is itself a conscious act. We cannot escape consciousness. This view is incoherent. Secondly, can it be lived? Do we live as though we are walking packs of neurons? We don't. We live as though we each have a unique first-person perspective on the world. We write and read autobiographies, by and large, is assuming their truthfulness of that person's experience. Mindfulness gurus tell us to focus on this inner self for a better state of well-being. Even the post-truth society that we find ourselves in defines truth by experience. So which is it? We have tied ourselves up in philosophical knots. Either there is a first-person experience by which you define this new post-truth, or, or you don't. Moreover, we treat others as though they are conscious beings as well. We experience outrage and anger at things like human trafficking, humanitarian crises, and climate change, precisely because we believe that the people involved are not simply packs of neurons, but conscious beings who experience suffering. It cannot be lived. We don't live this way. We might believe it in the lecture theater. We don't live it on the streets. Thirdly, does it have explanatory power? Does it help make sense of the world? If something is true, it should help us make sense of the world rather than throw us into further confusion. Does the view that you are your brain make sense of human beings? Does it help explain what it means to be a person? It doesn't. It fails to explain this inner you that we all seem to have. And chalking it all down to cell voltages, neurotransmitters, and blood flow changes is simply not enough. Imagine I asked you to describe to me the smell of coffee. What would you say? You'd say you need to smell it. I can't break it down any further. And you couldn't offer me a, 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 a diagram of the chemical structure of caffeine and how it interacts with water. That won't get me any closer to understanding the smell of coffee. And philosophers talk about qualia. And qualia are these qualitative experiences that are impossible to describe physically. And we have these experiences all the time, things like seeing a color or tasting a food. 
And many scientists and philosophers believe that brain processes alone are not enough to explain qualia. Brain activity is not enough to explain human experience. And in fact, science from the clinic is suggesting that the connection between human consciousness and brain activity is much more complex than simply brain chemistry. There was a groundbreaking imaging study led by uh, Professor Adrian Owen at the University of Cambridge, published in the journal Science in 2006, where they studied patients in a persistent vegetative state to see if there were signs of consciousness. And they were able to demonstrate that um, a small number of their patients showed conscious awareness despite having deeply damaged brains. The way that they did that was to get them to demonstrate that they were conscious using their minds. And they trained them to imagine playing tennis and imagine moving around their house. If you imagine you're playing tennis, your brain lights up all kinds of motor control and motor areas. And if you imagine moving around your house, all kinds of areas to do with spatial navigation light up. And they asked these patients a series of biographical questions that they could verify with family members. And they said, if you want to answer yes to this question, imagine you are playing tennis. If you want to answer no, imagine you are moving around your house. And they discovered that a small number of these patients were showing levels of consciousness. And Adrian Owen, who is not a theist, uh, describes his research in this way. We have discovered that 15 to 20 percent of people in the vegetative state are fully conscious, although they never respond to any form of external stimulation. Many really are as oblivious and incapable of thought as their doctors believe, but a sizable number are experiencing something quite different. Intact minds adrift deep within damaged bodies and brains. For example, Michael Egno, professor of neurosurgery at Stony Brook, um, makes the point that many of his patients are missing large parts of their brains but have quite good minds. And after 30 years of working in this field, Egno has concluded that the mind of a person is simply beyond the workings of their brain. And he concludes that materialism, the view that matter is all that exists, is the premise of much contemporary thinking about what a human being is. And yet, evidence from the laboratory, the operating room, and clinical experience points to a less fashionable conclusion. Human beings straddle the material and immaterial realms. Now, to finish, we could say that much discussion is taken up with what consciousness is. But a way to break the philosophical stalemate is to return to where we started and ask, why does it exist in the first place? What is it for? Now, to discern the purpose of something, the scientific approach is often to trace it back to its origins, to its beginnings. Well, what are the origins of consciousness? Where did consciousness begin? Of course, your beliefs determine how far back we look. If we believe that the natural world is all that there is, then our search for the origins of consciousness will reside within nature, within this world. But what if the origins of consciousness are more ancient even than this? Is the natural world all that there is, or is there more? And if nature alone is not enough to explain human consciousness, perhaps we need to expand the scope of our search beyond nature. The Judeo-Christian faith has a lot to say about this. The very first verses of the Bible say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, a conscious, rational being known as God 
is fundamental to the universe. And before there was anything physical, there was God. And as Jesus said, God is spirit. And if this is true, then we have grounds for making sense of the human mind. And there is hope for solving the hard problem of consciousness. Human beings, this view says, are made by God and are known by him and have the capacity to know God precisely because they are conscious beings. My story, in short, is that those questions that came into my consciousness as a child led me to the person of Jesus Christ as an adult. I arrived to study biochemistry at Bristol, an agnostic. I assumed, like uh, others that you've heard this evening, that science and God were incompatible. I had the chance to ask a question at an event known as Gorilla Christian, where I asked, surely you can't be a, a scientist and a Christian at the same time, and was told that, yes, you can. These are offering mutually compatible perspectives on the world. Well, that set me on a journey where I grilled a lot more Christians, I asked a lot more questions, and I got to the stage where it made more sense to believe that God was real than to discount him and continue without him. Around halfway through this biochemistry degree, I decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Christ. And it was wonderful to continue as a scientist, but also to know the God behind it all. And I came to realize that although the natural world was absolutely incredible, it was not all that there is. Not all that there is to life, not all that there is to human beings. I came to realize that we are so much more than our bodies and brains, and that there is an identity that runs so much deeper than my career, my influence, or even publication record. That identity was grounded and became grounded in my early 20s in a friendship with God through Jesus, a friendship that is available to all of us and that we are told will last forever. And if that is true, then there is hope for us all. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.